Well, welcome everybody. Thankful that you're here today with us to worship. If you have a Bible, would you open up to the Old Testament book of Ezra? Okay, Old Testament book of Ezra. If you have to go to the table of contents to find it, that'll be great. It'll take you a minute. But we're gonna be in Ezra chapter seven in just a few moments. When I was in college, I roomed with a guy. We lived in a house and, uh, and he was really, really smart, much smarter than me. He, was, he, he is a veterinarian now. He was, in, he was uh, studying to be a veterinarian. And uh, it was back in the day whenever everybody, when, when personal computers were just coming out. But when I say personal computer, I mean, it was like this big, huge thing you put up under a desk and have a monitor up on on the, you know, on your desktop and, and, and that's what it was. But he didn't have a, a PC like everybody else did. He had this thing called a Macintosh. And it was like this little bitty, you know, wormy thing. And I'm like, man, dude got ripped off. That's all I can say. I love him. He's smart, but he ain't that smart. That thing is just, that'll never work. Now, about that same time in college, there was this guy who would kind of sit around in public places. Look, we're in college. He was wearing a coat and tie, carrying a briefcase. And he would sit around and he would read the newspaper, particularly the stock report. Okay, that's back whenever you had to go to the paper and see what was up or down yesterday, what was high and what was low. And he would read that, and in my mind, I never said it out loud, but I thought, what a loser. Okay, now truthfully, I didn't even know what the stock market was when I was in college, quite honestly. My biggest concern was, how am I gonna get to the beach on spring break? Come on, can I get an amen, college students? I mean, that's really what you worry about when you're in college, not the stock market, for crying out loud. And I was thinking, man, what a loser, but... Now here we are, you know, nearly 40 years later, it feels like, and I just wonder what life could have been like for me had I had enough sense and foresight to just scrap together maybe $1,000 and invest it in that company Macintosh, which is now today a company you know as Apple. What kind of money, how would my life be different? No, see, that's the first time somebody said amen in the whole life in church, right? Now, by my calculation, I came up with somewhere between $750,000 and $1.5 million if I just invested $1,000. I had a guy after one of the earlier servers say to me, actually, $2.1 million is what it would be. And I was like, thanks a lot. So anyway, but who's the loser now, right? Who's the loser now? What I want to talk with you about today is making an investment. An investment that you may feel like a fool and may look like a fool to all your friends. They may not understand it. It might be a hard investment for you to make. It's gonna require some discipline, maybe even some pain. But I've heard somebody say recently, there's two kinds of pain, the pain of discipline or the pain of regret. And so though it's gonna require some discipline and pain, this investment is gonna pay off big time if you'll just keep making the investment. The investment I'm talking about is investing in your personal spiritual development as a follower of Jesus, okay? Our vision at Pine Lake, our prayer, what we really pray happens is that we could see the entire state of Mississippi transformed one life change story at a time, that that as people begin to walk with Christ, something would happen all across the state. The way we wanna see that vision accomplished, our mission is to make disciples. But when you say make disciples, there can be a lot of confusion around that, okay? Because if you Google disciple, it, it, it'll show up as anything from a rock band in Tennessee to a street gang in a, a major city, right? So, so a lot of a conversation around what is even a disciple, even in church, even at church. I've been a part of disciple now, disciple life, discipleship training. I memorized the disciples cross. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I mean, we throw the word disciple around all the time, but none of us really have agreement on what, is, what does it even mean, We were at a staff leadership retreat, I mean, a decade ago or more now, and we were talking about discipleship. Man, we need to be making disciples at Pine Lake. And we all agreed on that, but we couldn't agree on what was a disciple and how would we know if we made one. So we just called time out in our meeting, made everybody put up their computer and whatever else. You could only take your Bible. That was it. Only your Bible and a pen and paper and Look at what the Bible says a disciple is. And after an hour, we all got back together and we compared our notes. And this is what we came up with. The Bible says a disciple is. A disciple is a person who learns from Christ, lives in Christ, and leads other people 
to Christ. Hence the mission of our church is to make disciples who learn from Christ, live in Christ, and lead others to Christ. Learn, live, lead, three L's. You may not know this, but our Pine Lake logo actually has a cross, but the cross is the three L's. How many of y'all did not know that the Pine Lake logo had three L's that stood for discipleship, right? Most of us don't. A lot of staff didn't know that, but those three L's stand for what we're really all about. We wanna be people who learn from Christ, live in Christ, and lead other people to Christ. Most of us are familiar with the process of discipleship, what it looks like, okay? My dad was a hunter, and so he took me hunting and I became a hunter too. I went hunting and when I had a son, I took him hunting and guess what? He's a hunter now too. It's a process, right? And my dad taught me, I do it, I teach my son, that's discipleship. A good friend of mine who is a dentist told me that his education followed this pattern. Watch one, do one, teach one. That you watch, you learn it, then you do it, then you teach it and you really aren't ready to, to practice dentistry until you can teach somebody how to do what you're about to do. Even in sports circles, we have coaches that have coaching trees. So if you think about the West Coast offense, originated with a guy named Bill Walsh in the 80s, he came up with the West Coast offense, he implemented and won multiple Super Bowls with it. On his staff was a guy named Mike Holmgren who learned the West Coast offense too and he went out to Green Bay, became the head coach and he implemented that system and he too won a Super Bowl. On his staff was a coach named Sylvester Croom who learned that system, brought it to Mississippi State and that's a terrible example, I know. <laughs> right? But y'all get it, right? You, you get it. This guy teaches that guy, that guy learns it, he teaches the next guy and so on. Jesus wants you to become a disciple of his who learns from him, lives in him, and leads other people to him. Y'all get that? That's what he wants from you. If nobody else gets it, that's what he wants you to do. If nobody else on your row gets it, he wants you to do that. That's what he wants you to do. It's his call on your life. Now, I wanna try to integrate for you the last three messages, this one and the two previous, so that you see holistically at Pine Lake what we mean whenever we're talking about Jesus-centered life and, and being the church and, and, and L3 discipleship. This is what it looks like. It's gonna be on the big screen so you can see it. All right. At the center, at the heart of being a disciple is this reality, the Jesus-centered life, all the three circle drawings, that Jesus is your salvation, he is your identity, he is your life, he is your authority. Those are theological truths. That's theologically true, that's God's word, it's what it says, and you gotta put that on lock at the center of your heart, this is true. But the way it shows up practically in your life is this middle circle that we call be the church. It's becoming a person who on the outside begins to grow in the word, pray, who connects with other people and shares. As Christ is transforming my heart, I grow, I pray, I connect, and I share. But all of that is wrapped in the wrapper of what we call being a disciple, learning, living, and leading. What? Learning the Jesus-centered life, learning how to be the church. And you can go a mile deep on any one of these things. Bible studies out the wazoo on each of those things. But the purpose is so that you would become more like Jesus. Okay, y'all with that? So when we talk about discipleship, this is what we're talking about. Now, Jesus had disciples. He invited them to follow him. Remember, he walks by Matthew's tax collecting booth one day and he says two words, follow me. Same thing happens with Philip. Go to John chapter one and you would see Jesus is seeing Philip and he says to Philip, just follow me. He says to Peter, James, John, and Andrew, hey, leave your father's fishing business and follow me and I will make you to be fishers of men. Follow me, literally come with me be with me, hang with me, apprentice from me, learn my way. And they did, they followed him and they learned his way. They learned by Jesus' words and his deeds. They learned what he said and what he did and why he did it and how. And then they lived it out. He said to them, now y'all go do it. Just look up Luke 9, 1 and 2. He gave them authority and power to go out and cast out demons and to heal people and to proclaim the kingdom of God and they did it. 
Okay, They're, he's not doing it. He's taught them to do it. They're doing it now. And ultimately, after Jesus was dead, buried, resurrected, before he ascends into heaven, he says to him in all four gospels and the book of Acts, now, y'all go do this. Lead this. Go make disciples of all nations. I see that same pattern, learn, live, lead, in the book of Ezra where we are today. I was reading my L3 Bible reading plan because I'm a disciple. I was reading, I was reading in Ezra and came across that same plan. Now, if you don't know anything about the book of Ezra, Ezra is in the Old Testament. Ezra lived during a time when the children of Israel had been bad. They had disobeyed God. God sent them into exile in Babylon for 70 years. A group of Israelites have come back to Jerusalem and they rebuilt the temple. There's another guy named Nehemiah who's gonna come back in a few years and rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. But in between that, this guy named Ezra shows up. And Ezra is a preacher of sorts. He's a scribe skilled in the law. And he shows up and he gets back and they built the temple, but people are living like crazy. Like, what are you doing? They've just become like the culture around them. Imagine that. And he says, it's not right. This is not what God wants for us. And, and God used Ezra's life to bring transformation to a community and a culture. And listen to me, I think he wants to do the same thing through you and me. So students, can I, can I talk to you for just a second? If nobody else gets it, maybe you guys get it. You don't know what God's gonna do in your life, but you gotta trust him and invest in yourself. At any, as a young adult, high school kid, young adult, old folk, God wants to use, I'm convinced, he wants to use you. What could he use me for? He could use you to change a marriage. He could use you to change your house. You might just rub off on your other kinfolk, right? He might use you to change things around you. So would you lean in and listen? to how God did it through a, a dude named Ezra. Matt, Luke, Ezra chapter seven, verse six says, this Ezra, he went, from ba went up from Babylon and he was a scribe. He was skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all he requested because the hand of the Lord as God was upon him. Now, if you've got your Bible open, I want you to underline that phrase. The, because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. It's gonna come back in just a minute again in, in, in verse nine. Some of the sons of Israel and some of the priests, the Levites, singers, the gatekeepers, the temple servants went up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of the king, Artaxerxes, and he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first of the first month, he began to go up from Babylon, and on the first of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. Here's why. Did, why was his journey successful? Because the good hand of his God was upon him. Underline it again in your Bible, verse 9. God's, hand, God's blessing this guy. Now here's the million dollar question. Why is God blessing Ezra? Why are things going well for Ezra? Verse 10 answers the question. Four, circle that in your Bible. Circle it. Here's why God is honoring this man. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Ezra studied the law of God. He learned it. He practiced it. He lived it. And then he taught it. He led other people to it. And that's what God wants to do for you. That's what he wants to do with you right now. So if you're a note taker, would you write this down? As a follower of Jesus, I need to learn from Christ. This is where it starts. I need to learn from Christ. Ezra set his heart. In other words, he wasn't kind of, you know, haphazard. This became the most important thing. It was his priority in life. He disciplined himself for this. This was his big rock. He might not do other things, but he's gonna do this. What? Study the law of the Lord. He wanted to frequent it. He wanted to come back to it time and time again and find out what God says. He's not worried about what everybody else says. That may matter, but what really matters, what does God say about life and living? So he devoted himself to studying the 10 commandments at a micro level, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis through Deuteronomy at a, at a greater level. Most people who were scribes memorized the first five books of the Bible. Ezra probably memorized those books. 
He studied the lives of the Old Testament kings and he he leaned into the words of the prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah to make sense of his world. Why? Because he wanted to know. He devoted himself to knowing the word of God and the way of God and the heart of God. Like him, a guy named Isaiah says this, Isaiah 50 verse four, he, God awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. Isaiah says, every day I wake up and God wakes up my ear to listen to him, to God as his disciple. At the center of Isaiah's being, God's spirit was helping him to understand and hear the word of God. This is so counterintuitive to a lot of us guys and some girls too, who, man, we're action oriented. Let's go do, man, let's go take the hill. Let's get better, let's do better. But God says, before you go do better, you got to learn to be better. Let God show you what to go do, or you may be doing the wrong thing. Y'all remember the story of Mary and Martha in the Bible? They're Jesus' good friends. And one day Jesus is coming to their house, and um, Martha is, I mean, Martha is like freaking out. She is, she is getting everything done. She is working her fingers to the bone. She is cooking. She is cleaning. She is grinding. She is getting it done. And Mary, her sister, is sitting in the living room at Jesus' feet with the rest of the disciples just soaking in Jesus. And and Martha worked up a good mad. Come on, ladies, y'all ever worked up a good mad? She has worked up a good mad. She's broke off at, at Mary and she storms into the room, says, Jesus, you better tell her to get herself up and get in here and help me. And Jesus is like, whoa, girl, chill. Yeah, you, you, you need to calm down. You, you're worried and bothered about so much stuff. And then he says this in Luke 10, 42. He says, but only one thing is necessary. Everybody say necessary. Necessary. Only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Jesus said, she chose to sit at my feet and that's necessary and that is good and it is a choice that you have to make. Were the preparations important? Yeah, but only one thing was necessary. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you wanna grow in your faith, you gotta learn to hear from the word of God. And sometimes you do that by listening to sermons and going to Bible studies and podcasts and conferences and seminars and a million other things. And that's all awesome. You should keep doing that. But you need to hear that at Pine Lake, we wanna help you become a self theater on God's word. In other words, you don't need me. You don't need your favorite podcaster. You don't need Beth Moore or uh, K author to teach you God's word. The Holy Spirit's going to teach you God's word. Again, the Jesus centered life, the spirit lives in you. This is the, uh, the identity that you have now he's there. And from the inside out, you can commune with God and you can pray, God, show me what this word is saying today. And God can show you. And so we have a L3 reading plan that helps you learn, live, and lead as a disciple. And whenever you read each day or most days, you can just say, God, show me something in here about you, something in here about me, and how we can do life together. And so we read it, we, we write a thing or two of examining, hey, this is what was happening. I apply it, God, this is what it's saying to me today, and then pray, God, help me to live this. You can do this. Uh, I do this. Uh, I told you, last week that I've been reading the book of Job, probably got another two weeks in the book of Job. And um, it was just timely, it was on point. It was, on, it was just, it's just been good for me reading all that Job went through uh, last week because of some health stuff my wife had been going through. But this week, my mother-in-law who lives right there with us, she had a shoulder replacement surgery on Wednesday. Things were going good, but Wednesday night, she stood up from the table and passed out. And we don't know what it was. We don't know what it was, but I mean, within a matter of minutes, we got fire truck, two ambulances. I mean, our, our house was lit up like a Christmas tree. And everybody's wondering what's going on. We don't know what's going on. My wife is freaking smooth out because she's the one who's holding her mama. She sees death in her eyes. And all the way to the ER, my wife said, Jesus, please don't let her die. Please don't let her die. Please don't let her die. And I was just thinking about, you know, God, you said in Job, you're the one who sits enthroned above the heavens and above the stars and above the sun. God, you see it all and you're in control of all of it. So God, would you be in control of this? And I'm just telling you, it gave me peace and I was able to speak peace to my wife straight out of the word of God that had been downloaded into my heart in the days before. 
I was reading this week in Luke 14. It's my New Testament reading right now in the Gospel of Luke. And man, the, the teaching in Luke 14 starts off about humility. Humility, be humble before God. Be humble before God. And he gets to the end of that chapter and he says, now, if you're going to battle against somebody and you know you don't have enough, if a king's going to battle, you know the other army's bigger than you, you go ask for terms of peace. And, and, and he's not really talking about war. He's trying to make a point about discipleship. If you don't have what it takes to live the life Christ has called you to live, ask him for help. And I'm like, Jesus, I really need help because I can't do what you've asked me to do here. I can't do it. But you can. Yesterday, I'm reading in Luke 17 and my life's like your life, man. I got drama going on at times at places and and, and, and Luke 17 starts this way. It says, in, it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come. I'll translate that. It's inevitable that you have drama. Anybody got drama? Don't point at them, but anybody got drama, right? Hey, your family's like my family. Your work environment's like my work environment. Your school's probably like my school used to be. You can have girl drama. You can have couple drama. You can have all kinds of drama and I feel like such a loser when it happens on my watch. I feel like a loser when there's drama. Do y'all ever feel that way? Like it's, like it's all my fault, we should not, this should have never happened, whatever. But the word said right there, it is inevitable. People just do stuff. You can't stop that from happening, but what you can do is when it does happen, make sure that you talk it out and Ask for and repent and, and, and give forgiveness if you can get it and be reconciled as much as possible. And I was like, God, that is my daily bread right now. God speaks daily and I need it. And I'm saying to you, if you would put yourself, I believe, in that place each day where you say, God, I need to sit at your feet and just listen to you speak to me from your word. God, give me wisdom. Holy Spirit, help me. I'm convinced Jesus will help you because he promised to, John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but what, what he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. Do you understand that promise is to every follower of Jesus that if you will ask the Holy Spirit to help you understand, he'll show you how to be a better mama. He'll teach you how to be a better son. The Holy Spirit does that. And you might just find that reading the Bible isn't a chore. It might just become the delight of your life like the psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 97, who says, oh, how I love your law and I meditate on it all day. I love it. You need to learn from Christ in the word. Secondly, you need to learn as a follower of Jesus, you're gonna need to live in Christ. Ezra set his heart not just to study the law, but to practice it, to do it, to accomplish it, to walk it out, obey it, to get her done. Isaiah 50 verse five says, the Lord God has opened my ear and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. He says, I heard what God said and then I started doing it. I wasn't disobedient and I didn't you know, walk away from it. Do y'all ever act like, somebody ever ask you to do something, you act like you didn't hear them? Come on, every married man in here ought to say yes. Oh, I didn't even hear you. And I think women do it too. Y'all don't act so pious. Oh, I didn't even hear you, honey. Yes, you did. You didn't want to do it, right? Isaiah says, man, I, when I heard God speak, I didn't act like I didn't hear it. I didn't turn back. I just did what he said to do. Well, you know, whenever we first stopped having Sunday night church at Pine Lake, People hazed me mercilessly. I think my mama even questioned if I was a Christian. <laughs> no Sunday night church, son? No, no Sunday night church. Why not? And I said, mama, they don't do what I told them on Sunday morning. Why would I go tell them some more to do on Sunday night? <laughs> right? Could it be true? Let me think about it. If you're not doing what God's already told you to do and you know it, why are you asking him to tell you something new? Do it. Live it out. Jesus warned, listen to me, Jesus warned about being so theologically smart. Oh, you know the Bible like the back of your hand. He warned about knowing it, but not letting it 
Change your heart and actually live it. Listen to Matthew 7, verse 15. Beware of false prophets. People who teach, but they're false. They tell the truth, but they're false. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. Grapes aren't gathered from thorn bushes, are they? Nor figs from thistles, are they? Nope, verse 20. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Jesus says the way you know a person's legit is not by how many people listen to their podcast or how many people go to their church or attend their Bible study or how many people say, this is what the Bible says you're supposed to do. That ain't it. When you, really, when you wanna know if a person's legit, is their heart transformed and do they bear the fruit of a changed heart? That's what he says. I, I, didn't, I didn't study forestry at Mississippi State University. I can't walk through the, through the woods and the bushes and go, well, there's a pear tree and there's an apple tree and there's a sawtooth oak. I can't. But if it's got fruit on it, I can. Once the fruit comes out, well, yeah, that's what it is. Y'all, know, y'all feel me? Anybody can say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I follow Jesus. But let me tell you, let me ask you, what does the way you treat your spouse or your mom and daddy say? How do you show up then? How's the way you're doing business? How does your faith show up then? It's not just saying the words, it's, Am I living this out? Because if we're not careful, we can know all the rules of the father's house and miss his heart, just like that older brother in Luke 15 who was mad when the prodigal came home. I kept all the rules. And the dad's saying, but you don't know my heart. You don't know my heart. My heart is to restore. So discipleship, discipleship should impact your head, your heart, and your hands. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to get you to understand. That discipleship, if you're following Jesus, it should impact your head, your heart, and your hands. Your head in that, man, you get to know God. You get to know what he's like and what he has and what he's about. And you get to know who you are and what you have in Christ and what your life's supposed to be about. And that word that goes into your ears, into your brain, is supposed to, by the power of the Holy Spirit, make its way to your heart so that you surrender to that word. You are humble before God. You say, God, make me more loving and like you are and like you've made me to be so that whenever I act with my hands, it's flowing from a transformed heart. I'm doing what I really have become. Here's the danger. When all you have is knowledge in your head, but your heart's not changed and you're not doing anything with it, you're a spiritual couch potato. That's not it. I'm not hating on you. I'm just saying that's not it. But let me tell you what's as dangerous. It's whenever you know the Bible and you start trying to do the Bible, but you have not had your heart changed because now you're religious and you teach the Bible study and you're trying to do better and white knuckle it. But when the pressure hits, the real you comes out, that heart comes out and it's ugly, isn't it? It's ugly. That's why we used to say live for Christ, but that's not it. We live in Christ because Christ has to change you from the inside out. You, you can fake it for a while. Come on. I tell people whenever they're dating, thinking about getting engaged and married, you better date him or her for one year because you can hide crazy for a while, but you can't hide it for a year. Now, somebody ought to say amen, right? You can't hide crazy that long. Some of y'all are like, I wish I would have listened, preacher. Yep. Well, now God's just gonna have to make Wine out of the water, right? Out of lemonade, out of your lemons. But he can do it. But, but you can hide crazy for a while, but you can't hide it forever. That's why watch a person's actions and say what's going on in their heart. No, 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 here's the deal. Would you stop thinking about who needs to be listening to me right now? Because y'all know what you think. I wish he was here, he'd be listening to this right now. Stop thinking about who needs to be listening to this right now. And let me ask you, are you listening to this right now? Are you hearing God talk to you? Can 
can you really say, oh, I'm spiritually mature if there's really not much change in your life and everything stuff happens or somebody comes at you, you blow up and you get big and you always have to be right and you have to get your way or you're gonna pout. You got no control over your appetite. You got no control over your anger. You got no control over your spending. You can't really tell the truth about what you're thinking or feeling right now. You keep stuffing you know, your, your, your feelings at work or with your friends and you're just miserable. You quote the Bible till the cows come home. You can teach a million people. But if you're not living out of that truth and in that truth you're teaching, you cannot say that you're really a mature Christian person. I know that because I've done it. I have a PhD. I have a PhD. I have a PhD in Greek and New Testament. All that means is I can pile it on high and deep. That's what that means. PhD, pile it high and deep. I can make your head spin with useless knowledge about the Bible. That's what that means. But I have a PhD and I would still act a fool when my wife confronted me. My ace apart, that part of the guy in the, in the Old Testament, a godly man, trust God for big things, but when the, a prophet came and confronted him, he blew up on that guy, throws him in prison and starts oppressing everybody. When God showed me that, I'm like, I am a hot mess. There's an insecurity that, that lodged in my life for a long, long time where I would become whatever I needed to become to make you like me. You want me to be cute, I'll be cute. You want me to be funny, I'll be funny. You want me to be an achiever? I'll be an achiever. You want to go win that game? We'll go win that game. You want to go be bad? I'll go be bad. I just need you to approve of me. And, and it was look, it, I, it didn't die whenever I became a, a preacher. It didn't quit whenever I, 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 I got married. I drug it right on up into my adult life. And it wasn't until I realized I can be a hot mess and I'm tired of trying to live a million different lives and just say, God, I just need you to tell me who I really am. And once I got there, now then... I can be me around you. And I want you to like me, but if you don't, it'll be okay. I'll be okay. I was not honest to God. I was religious. I would super spiritualize everything. I don't know if y'all know what that looks like to not be honest to God and super spiritualize everything, but it's like this. When your world's falling apart, you go, yeah, but God's good. Things start happening and it's bad. And you go, well, old devil's just on our back. Well, God is good, but sometimes I'm mad at God and I don't understand God. And I had to learn to say, God, you got to be big enough to handle what I'm about to say to you, but I got stuff I got to say to you. And I just help tell God all this stuff. And you know what I found? I found he's big enough to handle my lament. And you know what? The devil does suck and he does try to get me, but sometimes I suck. Sometimes I just blow it and I miss it. And you know what? God is able to handle that and I don't have to hide or sugarcoat or super spiritualize it. I can just say, God, it's me. And I like me a whole lot better this way. And so I wanna say to you, God, look, God's changing my life. And I'm trying to share my life with you and say to you, he wants to change you too. Life transformation, listen to me, life transformation is the mark of a disciple. Fruit in keeping with repentance has to be seen because Jesus is gonna change you from the inside out. And those who are truly his disciples are not those who can stand up here and preach and say, Lord, Lord. It's those who say, God, help me to go home and live with my family or God to walk through tragedy or God to make good God-honoring decisions. John 14, 21, Jesus says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, that's the one who really loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and I'll disclose myself to him. When I read that years ago, I started making this cycle in my life. God, I wanna know you and I wanna love you. And God, if I love you, I'll obey you. But if I obey you, it says that you'll show me your love and you'll reveal yourself to me and I can love you more, obey you more and experience you more and, and see more of you. That's the process of discipleship. So here's my question to you. Okay, here's what it gets to you. Is your life appreciably different today than it was the day you say you accepted Jesus? And if so, how? How's your life appreciably different today than it was the day you say you follow Jesus. 
I'm not hazing you. I'm trying to do what the Bible says. Hey, whenever we get together, we're supposed to stimulate each other to loving good deeds. I'm just asking you an honest question that could maybe help you to start investing and living in a new way. If you would say, yeah, man, my life actually is appreciably different than what it was whenever I started following Jesus decades ago, then here's the next question. Okay, is your life appreciably different today than it was a year ago? Because we're gonna keep growing until he comes. Discipleship is not just what you say you believe in your head. It's declared by the way you live your life from the inside out, okay? Learn from Christ, live in Christ. Here's the last thing, lead others to Christ. As a follower of Jesus, lead others to Christ. Ezra 7.10 says that Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to practice it, and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel, to teach it, to instruct, to help people learn and become skillful. When you look at the Hebrew word, it's actually a picture of an ox goad. You don't know what an ox goad is, I had to look it up too. It's a stick, an eight foot stick with a, with a spear on the end of it that a farmer would use to teach a a new cow how to learn how to plow. And so the the, the cow would be uh, strapped to to the plow and the farmer would start to say commands and if the cow didn't listen, he would take that stick and jab that cow in the booty so that the cow goes, I don't think I'll do that again. And he'll learn, he's teaching that cow. When he says go left, he's going left. When he says go right, he's going right. When he says stop, he's going to stop. He's teaching him with that ox goad, okay? A shocker. So one idea we've had is to give all of our small group leaders shock collars and put them on everybody in small group. (laughs) And if you give the wrong answer, they're going to zap you, right? We're not going to do that, but there has to be a way. Please hear me. The reason we're trying to say, hey, get in a group, Get in a Bible study. Get it, get so that you can, somebody can teach you how to walk like Jesus. That's it. Isaiah 50 verse four says, the Lord has given me the tongue of disciples so that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. The world is full of weary people. They're worn out. They hate faking it. They're tired of what's happening. They're mentally worn out. They're just emotionally spent. And you as a disciple of Jesus have the tongue of a disciple. You are sent to them to speak words of life that you've learned and you're living. So start to take advantage of your moments to teach it. I think about Bill Caldwell who has taught a lot of men at our church how to grow deeper. I think about Jan Feldman who last Wednesday night said to me she had received a lady in the response time some months back. She engaged with her, helped her to find her way spiritually, included her in her small group and Jan said, I'm gonna be out of town next week and she's gonna be leading our group. Isn't that crazy? I think about Jerry and Kathy Walter, two for years, have mentored people one-on-one uh, in their home or at local businesses. I'm thinking about Chris Gillard and, and uh, one of our elders named G. Ogletree who mentor kids in the inner city of Jackson. I'm thinking about college students, high school students that I know who while they're in college and high school turn around and they serve in 56 or 78, our middle school ministry to help other kids. I'm thinking about mothers and daddies and grandparents who you have kids in your house that you have the opportunity not to raise them up like your family did, but to disciple them toward Jesus. That as you learn and as you're living for Christ, you're saying to your kids and your grandkids, this is the way we live at our house. We follow Jesus. And you shape them not to be like your family history. You disciple them to Christ. 2 Timothy 2.2, Paul said, the things which you have heard from me in the great presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Listen to me, you're not truly a disciple. The process of discipleship is not complete in your life until you're teaching somebody else. And it doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be formal, can be, but it can be just investing life on life. But the point is I am teaching you how to live like Jesus. And all of us are called to do that. And if we all did that, I'm convinced the state of Mississippi just might be changed. Why? Why would you wanna do that? What do you care? I just want to live my life and be left alone. Why would you want to do it? Why would you want to learn, live, and lead? Here's why. It's an investment. 
looks stupid early on, feels foolish to all your friends, painful at times, discipline is gonna be required even, but if you just invest and continue that effort, make this effort, I'm convinced that there's going to come a day when you say it's worth it. It was worth it. When is that day gonna be when being a disciple of Jesus is worth it? Here's when it's gonna be worth it. Whenever you, trouble hits your life and you're driving yourself to the ER or, dri- or something, you're driving on the way to the ER, chasing an ambulance, and yet you're gonna have a strange peace in your heart that God's got this. Why? Because you're a follower of Jesus. And no, it doesn't turn out always like you want it to, but you still can have peace. Why? Because I have a hope higher than this life. You know when else you're gonna be happy? You're gonna be happy about that whenever success hits because most people can't handle success. You handle failure much better than you handle success. Everybody goes to God whenever failure hits, but when success hits, we forget God and you act a fool and God says, I have to take that away from you. Or you're acting like such a horse's tail that People aren't gonna wanna be around you. So you're gonna be disciple to Christ so that when your ship comes in, you stop and you go, thank you. You did that, not me, you did that. And people are gonna go, wow, man, that's awesome for you. You know when else you're gonna be happy you made this investment? When you get old. When you get old. I'm not old yet, I ain't gonna wear that label, but I'm getting there. But let me tell you something, time has a way of changing your perspective and all the people that looked like they were winning when we were 18 and 25 and 32 and 40, they ain't winning anymore. And all those people that looked like they were living boring lives, going to Bible study and being have. In their 50s, 60s and 70s, they winning. Their kids gather around and call them blessed. Their marriage is strong. Their finances are intact. They've got their health. I'm just telling you, this is an observation that what, if you really want to enjoy your 50s, 60s, and 70s, it matters what you do in your 20s, 30s, and 40s. You can't sow wild oats and then pray for crop failure. It doesn't happen. You have to sow to the Spirit, and from the Spirit, you reap life. You're gonna be thankful when you get old that you walked with God daily. I I believe that. And you're really gonna be thankful one day when Jesus comes back for you or for us. Because Colossians 3, 4 says this. It says, when Christ who is our life is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. And all those people who thought you were a fool are gonna look at you and go, dude, you were on it. You're gonna be so thankful you invested yourself in following Jesus. And so can we close? We're gonna have communion in just a moment, but can I, can, I, can, I, can I kind of draw the net today? Hey, would you hear the call of Christ to you today is not to go to church. It's not to do better. It's not to know the Bible. The call of Christ is to follow Jesus and be made like him that this is his calling. It's not Pine Lake's idea. It's not a church program. This is the commission that Jesus gave to the apostles. Go make disciples who make disciples. This is your purpose. And would you put it on lock that if you follow Christ at some point or another in your life, it's gonna be worth it because the good hand of God will be upon you just like it was upon Ezra. And Ezra got favor from the king, unfair advantage from the king because God's good hand was upon him. He, he got, he got a, a safe journey and protection and he got strength and comfort and everything he needed because God's hand was upon him. And why was God's hand upon the man? Because Ezra set his heart to study the law of God, to practice it, and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. And so today, is God calling you to follow? To live a Jesus-centered life that shows up in the way you grow in the word and pray and worship and live in loving connection with people. And you share your goods and your gifts and the gospel with the world around you. 
if you didn't get your communion supplies on the way in or if you're at home right now, you may need to, to, to make some, some adjustment for that or gather that up. If you didn't get it and you're in the room, you can just raise your hand. I've got some friends who have some uh, little packets of, of uh, juice and bread and they wanna help you. Make sure everybody has one who's a follower of Jesus. Communion is a, is a uh, sacred thing for followers of Jesus. Uh, can I say that again? Y'all listen to me. I know we're getting our stuff. But communion is a sacred thing for followers of Jesus. It's only for followers of Jesus, but for followers of Jesus, okay? So if you're on the end and somebody on your row has their hand up, you just wave, wave the ushers down so they can get it, okay? It's for followers of Jesus. So here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. With that cup in your hand and, and you can kind of peel off the top and have a piece of bread. This is what it reminds us of in these next few moments that Jesus came and lived a sinless life, that's the bread, and he died for your sins and mine, that's the cup. And so communion is for believers who say, I believe that and I receive that and I want to live that out. Okay? That's what it's reminding us of. But it's also a time for you to go, you know what, I've believed that for a long time, but today is my day to rededicate my life and to re-surrender to God. Any of y'all raised up in a church where people could come make a rededication? Oh, I'm just rededicating my life. This is a ba very Baptisty thing. Come down and rededicate. I just rededicate my life today, and next week I'm gonna rededicate my rededication. Come on, we were in that church. Y'all know what I'm saying? And sometimes you want it, sometimes you want to get baptized again. You want to get baptized again. I'm going to talk about baptism next week. You want to get baptized again because, you know, my life's just gotten such a mess since I was baptized the first time. Can I tell you, this is rededication. You don't need to be baptized again. What you need to do is in this moment with the blood and the body of Christ represented in your hand, you need to say to God, I surrender all right now. All of my mind, all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my being, all of my doing, I surrender to you again. I follow you, Jesus. That's what we're doing. This is that moment. So would you spend some time just praying and talking to God? There's gonna be a song that's sung over us, and then I'm gonna come back and lead us all to eat and drink together again, okay? So Lord, I love you. I thank you, God, for your word, living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword today. God, thank you. Let it now find a good spot in our heart. In every heart, God, let this word find a good spot. And would you bring forth fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold, Holy Spirit. We commit our way to you, Jesus, because you committed your way to us. And we give our lives back to you again today because you give everything to us. So we commune with you. We worship you. We surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen.